If you need a Bible, go ahead, raise your hand, and uh, one of our ushers would love to get you a Bible. Psalm 47. Psalm 47 is, uh, it's a really special psalm. It's a psalm for us when life feels out of control, or maybe just your home does. It's a psalm that we need when the questions in our life are pretty high, and when your anxiety is even higher. It's a psalm for you when you feel idols pulling at your flesh. When your heart is lacking peace. It's a psalm for us in the greatest celebrations and moments and achievements in our life and also the greatest pits. Psalm 47 is a psalm that we need in the aftermath of election. And when we get hurricane warnings and tsunami watch and all this kind of stuff, this is the psalm that we need. Because what Psalm 47 does is declare that God is the king of all creation, okay? He's the only king with absolute authority. He's the sovereign king, meaning he's in control of all things. And he's the God who loves us. You guys excited about that? You ready to dive in? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for... Jesus, and for revealing yourself so completely in your Son, your kingship, your holiness, your love, your wisdom, and we are praising you before we ask anything from you tonight, praising you and exalting you in this place. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we find so much joy, Lord, as a church in just declaring that. But we are asking that you would speak to us tonight through your word, Lord, by your spirit, that you would make your word alive in our hearts. And we want to hear from you. I'm asking, Lord, that you would speak through me to my family so they'd walk away having heard from you transformed, not in the outside, but in their heart in the love. Help us to see you, who you are, high and lifted up, our King. We're praying for this in Jesus' name. Amen? All right. Well, Psalm 47, let's jump in. So the heading says, to the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Okay? Not much there, but it is important to note that this is a psalm of the sons of Korah. Why? Because the first eight psalms of book two in the psalms, which are 42 to 49, are written by the, by the sons of Korah. Okay? Again, we've, we've talked about this, I think, at large in Psalm 42 and 43 and 44. So I'm not going to, you know beat the drum too much, but the sons of Korah are the sons who really have tasted and know God's grace. They're the sons who are living through all of the crazy chaos in the time of the kings, right? So that's important to know because as we read Psalm 47, we could have the tendency to say, okay, that's easy for you to say. It's not. I mean, they're speaking the truth because they're living during a time when there's all kind of broken kings, They're the sons, actually, who see the rise and the fall of kingdoms. And they pen this psalm, not about the earthly kings and the earthly circumstances, about God, their king. And it matters that Psalm 47 is written by the sons of Korah and that we're talking about it because there's actually a flow, okay? So the past five weeks, they've written the psalms that we've talked about and studied and read. And and, and that's significant because Psalm 47 actually falls in the context of a larger train of thought. You tracking with me? If we were to just read Psalm 47 in isolation and ignore what they said in 42, 43, 44, 45, and 46, we don't actually know the kind of thought that they're developing, right? So I'm going to go through it just a little bit. So in Psalm 42 and 43, the idea, you guys remember Psalm 42, 43? It's, where are you, God? Where are you? Some of the things that stand out is, have you forgotten me? That's what they wrote. They say, my adversaries taunt me day and night, saying to me, where is your God? And I don't know how to answer that. It doesn't seem like you are there. In 42 and 43, it's repeated. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Psalm 42 and 43. It's the psalmist, sons of Korah, crying out. It's those times in our life when God feels absent, when everything feels messed up, and the hands go up, And you say, God, do you see 
What's happening? Where are you? And then Psalm 44. God, help. God, save. That's the idea. In verse 23, the sons of Korah actually write, Why are you sleeping, God? Awake! Don't reject us. Don't reject us. That's a strong thing to say. They're saying, why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? And the last lines of Psalm 46 include this. God, rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Meaning, God, I know you're there. But it feels like you've rejected us and abandon us and we're crying out for you to show up and help and redeem and save which is so beautiful because what is Psalm 45 about Psalm 45 is that God will send a king meaning he will save he will help he hasn't abandoned he is going to redeem how He's going to send us what? A king. And Myola went through it and he was talking about how that king is messianic, right? He's not talking about this earthly king. A final king. Our final help. It's why in verse 1 of Psalm 45 it says, I address my verses to the king. I have a good theme on my tongue. This is what he's saying. And then in verse 46, you begin to see, even though maybe the circumstances in his life haven't changed yet, the son of Korah, the psalmist is writing, beginning to shift a little bit. Psalm 46 is all about God is our stronghold. He's our fortress and our refuge. In verse 11, the God of Jacob is our fortress. And what Milo was talking about last week was, We're to focus on God, not all of the craziness around us. No longer like the what ifs and what abouts and the whens. He's like, it's about God. Look what the psalmist is doing in the middle of these things. What does he hone in on? He hones in on God, our fortress. And and Milo is talking about, you know, the, the verse, be still and know that I'm God. The context of that, remember what he said? It's in the middle of what? War. War time. The stillness actually takes a place, place when everything around us feels crazy. The commandment is given to us when there's chaos and uncertainty and all these kind of what ifs around us. The idea is be still and know that he's God. And he left us off, Milo did, saying something really strong. He said, now and in eternity, God is our refuge and our strength. And stillness of the heart on that truth, even in the middle of Conflict and loss and hurt and sorrow, a raging war leads to assurance. That's Psalm 47. The psalmist looking up in the middle of it saying, not only are you my stronghold and my refuge, you are the king. You're not just going to send a king, you're going to be the king that comes. Is that making sense? All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. He says, oh, clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with a voice of joy. For the Lord most high is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. And I want to pause right there. Which is such a distinct shift from what happened in Psalm 46. Psalm 46 leaves off with like, be still, right? This this idea of stillness in the middle of all this kind of stuff. And do you see now how Psalm 47 picks up? Clap your hands. Shout to God with a voice of joy. It's as if the stillness... And knowing God is God moves the heart from a place of sorrow to shouting. Shouting joy, celebration. He says, clap your hands. And that's a really interesting thing that he says because there's a double meaning in it. In one sense, he's talking about this, you know, like the cheer, absolutely. But also the unique phrase here that's used for clap your hands means to strike hands together. Not necessarily in combat, combat, but like strike hands together, to pledge. One commentator said it means to come to an agreement. The idea in Hawaii is like two hands strike together. You see two brothers, they see each other from across the room, they walk up, what do they do? 
They strike hands together, they dap each other up, right? You bring it in, the striking of hands together, it's not a, a sign of enmity or war, it's actually, it's actually, it's a pledge, it's an agreement, it's a, it's a demonstration of peace. So the double meaning is, clap your hands, we're celebrating, we've got reason to celebrate, but it's also a, a challenge to the heart, make peace with God. Make peace with God, your king. You know, the idea is, you guys ever, um, maybe you ever seen a boxing match between like two fighters and one fighter is just so thoroughly outclassed the entire fight that by the end of it, everybody knows, including the other fighter, who's gonna win this fight, right? And so they're standing there almost, you know, it's just, just gotta get this thing done and, and the, the announcer has both of the fighters on his side, right? He's gonna announce who the winner is and everybody knows, right? He raises the hand of the winning fighter, announces the winning fighter and actually the losing fighter comes over and what? takes the hand, and sometimes lifts the hand up. And it's a sign, it's, it's a sign of concession that the, that the losing fighter looks to the one who's greater and says what? You're the better man. You're the better man. The, the clapping, the cheering, the raising of hands, yeah, it's a celebration, but it's also making peace, like you were the better fighter. And it's what the psalmist is driving for us, his people, to do, to look at God and say, you're worth celebrating. We've made peace. Peace with you, God. We've made peace. So let our clapping be a joyful noise and a reminder that we have peace with God. You're in here and the, you know, the song is going, you know this? Yeah, a cheer, but also like, why? Because we have peace with our King. We're not enemies anymore. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, He's not your enemy. What is He? Your Lord and Savior, and the trust and surrender that bow the heart metaphorically raise the hand of God in your life. And he wants this for all people. That's why he says in verse one, clap your hands who? All people. I don't know where everybody's at, but if you're not confident of your place with God, make peace tonight. Don't wait. Surrender your life to Christ. He's full of grace and mercy. It's not something you have to earn by faith. As we continue through, do you notice the way that we're to shout and praise and clap? And also the reason we shout and praise and clap? It's there in verse one, the last word. It's joy. We clap and we praise with joy. Joy should drive our hearts. Church, what is our praise worth if it's not joyful? Joyless praise is like flavorless salt. Our, our singing is meant to be, sometimes I think that the greatest, one of the most powerful, not the greatest, but one of the most powerful testimonies in your life is actually gonna be the joy that you live with. And the people in your home, like seeing your joy, especially as you're walking through things and they look at you and they say, you shouldn't be smiling. You shouldn't be walking around with peace. Like, I know I didn't. That, that screams volumes. How can this happen? And we know Psalm 47 says, because we have a king. God is our king and he's totally in control. And I love that joy is meant to define us and our praise, Thomas Watson says this, the old Puritan, God has no design upon us but to make us happy. Who should be cheerful if not the people of God? Amen? Amen. We have every reason, we have a million reasons to be cheerful. And if you're feeling low on joy, here's the reminder for you why we have joy. Verse two says, the Lord most high is to be feared and a great king over all the earth. And you're like, how does that make sense? The, the Lord is high and to be feared. How does that translate to joy? Because we're not at odds with this king anymore. He's our king who loves us and defends us and is our refuge. We should be at odds with this king considering how holy he is and great and his standard and his power and his might and all of this stuff. And also considering the amount we mess up and the amount that we make this life to be about ourselves and it's not or hurt people made in his image. Like, we should be at odds with him, but because of his grace toward us, the power that makes us quake, the might that makes us fear or tremble isn't a threat to us, it's actually our shield. So we have joy. 
a king who fights for us. That's exactly what happened in verses three and four. Let's look at it. He subdues people under us, nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob whom he loves. Selah. I love that. And pause right there. It's worth just ruminating on, thinking about. But these verses, verse three and four, are actually a subtle reference to when God's people come into the promised land and they you know, begin to conquer in the promised land. There's loaded phrases in here. I'm not gonna dive into all of it, but the glory of Jacob, inheritance, even specific words for nation and people, they're all references back to Joshua and Numbers. So I think I have a couple of references overhead on the screen. Um, but if you want to just dive back and look into some of that here, what he's trying to trigger, the psalmist writing these things for us in this way, is thinking about how Israel was a wandering people coming out of Egypt. Remember that? And they didn't have a lot. And they weren't a lot. They were just this wandering people. They're outnumbered and outsized by all the other nations and peoples that are established in their land. Yet they had a king fighting for them, a refuge from giants. So the psalmist, and thinking back to the conquest and how this like small group of people is conquering this land, is saying it's not about the odds. It's about the king. He, he's trying to lift their eyes and, and actually rooting God's kingship historically being with his people. Even if physically like you didn't see him or something, it was so clear that he was fighting with his people. Because how else would they have conquered in the land? Giants? No, it was about their king. And then he says something amazing in verse 4. He says, um, he chooses the inheritance for us. And I think that's so amazing because the psalmist doesn't seem mad about that. He actually seems really pleased that God would be the one who chooses the inheritance. That God is the one that chooses the outcome. Charles Spurgeon says it in this way. We're to submit our will, our choice, our desire wholly unto him. Our heritage here and hereafter we leave to him. Let him do with us as seems good to him. AKA, he got it. We can trust him. We can surrender the outcomes and the what ifs in this life to him. Why? What the psalmist is believing, what Charles Spurgeon is saying, is he knows best. I want to put it in this way. Um, when I go out to eat at a new restaurant, especially like a highly recommended place, one of, I think, the most enjoyable ways for me to experience a new restaurant or a new place or whatever is to go with somebody, what? Who's been there before, right? And what I like to do, I'm not sure if you're like me, I'm a bit adventurous in, in what I eat and stuff, but I love being with somebody who's kind of a pro or, or been there, done that, kind of gone to this place, knows the ins and outs, and I sit with them, I don't even open up the menu. You know what I say? I say to my friend, you choose. Why? Because they know best, like what's good, what's not. I, I, if it's just me, I'm just gonna go to the same old things, but, but just the deference in, in saying, I think you know better and I'm okay with actually you choosing the outcomes, what we're gonna eat. The psalmist is doing the same thing. He says, God, he's praising God for this. You're the one who chooses for us. That's so much better than us choosing for ourselves. What he's saying is God never holds out on us. And I, and I think that's important because it should shape the way that we pray. Here's how. Sometimes, often, I think we come and we pray and we just unload on God everything that we want to happen. Yeah? And that's okay because we're, we're to present our desire to him. But I think along with God, I want this so badly. There's a part of a heart that has to learn to say, and I know that you know I do. But I also, Lord, as badly as I want this, need for you to help my heart trust that you really do know what's best for me. I want you to help my heart to trust you in that way. To trust you with the outcomes. Here's what I think should happen, Lord. Here's what I'd like to happen, but you're God and not me. And that's okay. So whatever happens, it, it's freeing. It's so freeing. You, you walk away and the prayers, even the, the prayers that are answered no, are rejoicing. Why? 
you're not looking at that, no, like, God just shut me down. It's no, you know what you wanted, what you thought? I have something better. My plan, how I'm doing these things, I know it doesn't make sense to you right now, Duke. And I know maybe it's even hurting and it's going longer than you imagine. But I have something better that you never, ever could have imagined. And here's why we have that assurance. That type of assurance where we can just rest in God saying, you control the outcomes, I'm okay with that. The reality is that the Lord Most High, the great King of all the earth, verse four says he loves us. The glory of Jacob, that's a reference to his people. He loves you. He loves you, church. The King of this universe loves you. He's not holding out. That's, that's a truth to boast in. I, I was listening to a podcast um, recently, like a sports podcast, and you know, it was pretty funny because at one point in the podcast, these hosts begin to like brag about um, whose contacts of like really famous people in the world that they have in their cell phone and stuff, and you know, so one of them is like, oh yeah, I got this person's number in my phone, and da da da, and he's like, oh yeah, you think that's cool? I got this person, and then the other host is like, I got Oprah, you know, and then everybody's like, oh my gosh, you got Oprah, and every, that was like so, that was so amazing. Well, how special would you feel if, you know, if the Queen of England, when she was alive, knew you, knew you? How about if the queen didn't just know you, was your friend? How special would you feel? How about if the queen of England loved you? Loved you relationally? See what I'm saying to how we can become numb to the fact that the king of this universe loves you? Loves us? The king of this universe. That's the whole point of this psalm is we'd see God in his rightful place and it amazes us that he wants to lead us, that he, want, that he loves us, that he wants to know us, that he wants us to know him. This is the king of the universe. To understand love from God the king is life altering. Life altering. There's so much stuff out there talking about like, you know, you're in this bind, you're doing this, things aren't going right. You know, self-love, self-care, focus on yourself, self, self, self. I mean, I understand to a degree what they're trying to say. But family, the truest healing doesn't start when you're focused on yourself. Loving yourself and making that the priority. It starts with understanding that the king of all creation loves you. That's where, it all, that's, that's the root and the foundation of everything good. That's where true healing takes place. And the psalmist here is that God is the king and he loves us, family. He loves us. And then in verse five, the psalmist begins to see a picture. God has ascended with a, with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. You see that? The psalmist seeing God going up to his throne. He, he's just conquered, but now he ascends. He's ascending to his throne and it's the cause of more shouting, more celebration. You know, when it says that God has ascended with a shout, it's not God shouting, it's his people. Is people cheering that their king is in his proper place. It's, it's that same kind of holler, celebration, cheer when, you know, you, when an elected official wins, wins the position, wins an election, and, and, and you got that like, yeah, let's go. Like, all right, we're going to be okay. Change is coming. You know, like everything's in its right place. God is going up to his throne, and his people are like, that's what we need. And God is the king. And the king of my life, like, all right, we're on track. It's actually the same scene, the celebration, the shouting that should challenge and encourage us. That scene in 2 Samuel chapter 6 when the ark is coming into the city. David is bringing it in there and the people are shouting and praying. It's the same thing. It's why actually 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7, you know, follow in the same way that they do. It says, verse 6, sing praise to God. Sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises, verse seven. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. It's funny, um, what's repeated there over and over? Sing praises, like we get the point, right? We know what you want for us to do. So how come, how come you repeat it like this five times? Sing praises, sing praises, sing praises. One, it's fitting. 
It's appropriate. It's what should happen when we see the king ascend to his throne. When we see the king as king of this universe. Praise is the natural byproduct of actually understanding that truth. But secondly, what the author is trying to do is make a poetic emphasis. He's using structure here. Something called chiasm. It's mirrors. Structure is basically paralleling who our praise should go to. You see how it says sing praises and sing praises in the middle is who? To God. And then again, sing praises and sing praises in the middle is what? To our king. And then in verse 7 it says, God is the king. So what follows it? Sing praises. It's not just that we should be singing. The psalmist is trying to emphasize for us who we're supposed to be giving our worship to. To who? To God. Our God. For God is the king. Here's why I think he does this. We're always worshiping something. Yeah? It's not about if, it's about who or what we worship. And the flesh, not the new heart, but the flesh is prone to wander off and try and worship other things. We see that around us, sometimes we see that in us. Men who are willing to give up everything for a career. And you see the lives just falling apart around them for money or for pleasure. And the homes are the wreck, or relationships are wrecked for pleasure. A moment, a, a thing. We see it in women, in worship. We spend so much time and money and thoughts on what they look like. They're just dwelling and daydreaming and imagining and planning what's gonna adorn them, staring at themselves in mirror. Teenagers, worship who will do pretty much anything to get friends. Pretty much anything to preserve a reputation. What they want so bad is to be accepted, to be admired or loved. The terrifying thing about letting our hearts sing after anything else other than God is that when it does, it becomes an idol to us, right? Psalms 115 Verses 4 to 8, you can look overhead. I'm not going to read through it. But the idea here in Psalm 115 is that the idols like that you worship, that we worship, you know, we make them with our hands. They can't see, they can't speak, can't hear, can't smell, can't feel, can't walk, can't even do nothing. They're, they're impotent, they're powerless. Verse 8, here's the punchline. What does it say? Those who make them will be like them. So will all who trust in them. You become like what you worship. And it's a warning, and Psalm is saying is like, giving worship to anything else less than the God of this universe, the king, is sinful and it's settling. Because on the flip side, St. Augustine says it in a positive light. He says, great are you, O Lord, greatly to be praised. Great is your power, and of your wisdom there is no end. You've made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. That's the whole point of worship. It's meaning to end in the spot that it was always created to find in God. That's why what verses six and seven say about sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, not only fitting, but it's what our lives are meant to do. Our lives, and not just here on Saturdays or Sundays, are meant to sing praise to God, to glorify God, to testify to God's Highness and glory and might. And the last two verses of this psalm end with kind of this repeating theme that we've been seeing in Psalm 47, the idea that God is the king, that he's highly exalted. Verse 8 says, God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. If I could summarize that, the point here, and even the literal translation, the first line of verse 8, God reigns, literally is translated, God is the king. Again, God is the king over and over. God is the king 
over the nation. He's on his throne and he's over, verse 9, all of the peoples. And the idea here, the princes of the peoples assembling themselves. What does that even mean? The idea is that, is that all these peoples, everything belongs to him. And he wants for the people to come to him like his people, the people under Abraham. Come to God and to see how high and exalted he is. The NLT translates it actually in this way, that the rulers of the world have gathered together with the people of the God of Abraham. Why? For all the kings of the earth belong to God. That's it. Verse 8 and 9, it's, it's just telling us that everything belongs to him. Do you realize that? The time you have belongs to who? God. So then your resources and your energy and your thought and your time are matters of stewardship in the heart. God has given these things to me. They belong to him but he's given these things, entrusted these things to me to use how? In the way that would exalt the king. Everything belongs to him. He's exalted and glorious over all of it. This is his kingship. This is the whole point of the song. Psalm, he has no competitors. This is his world, gang. This is it. And the fingerprints of his glory and his rule are all over the place. I was just talking to a brother the other day about a sunset and he was just like fawning over the way like, he sees God in the sunset. I'm like, I, I get it. That's, I think that's exactly what it was meant to do. Sunsets, mountains, oceans, like, and the love in each other, like made in his image. This, we're supposed to see God everywhere. The heavens, Psalms say, declare, right, his glory. This is his creation, and he is the perfect king. He's the perfect king. Which brings us to something I'm going to trail off on just a little bit. Because, uh, this weekend, uh, the Jesus Kids, children's ministry here, um, their lesson actually asks a really sharp question in this regard. The question is, if God is our king, and if what Psalms 47 is saying is God is the king, he's on the throne, he's the perfect king, he's the king we need, why would God allow bad leaders and or bad things to be in charge and to happen? Isn't that a good question? What an incredible children's curriculum we have, right? Well, here's how it answers it. And I'm going to kind of expand a little bit. Here's the answer. Why would God allow bad leaders to be in charge? Well, they write, the Bible teaches us that God stands sovereign over all things, even the rise and fall of leaders. That includes the most godly of leaders and even those that are the most opposed to the things of God. The Lord and his good purposes may be seeking to wake us up bring consequence, or refine his people. But his purposes are always good. God is always working in all times and in all seasons. And though we may want wonder about his purposes in certain circumstances, we can trust that they are always ultimately for his glory and our good, even when that's hard to understand or believe. And it's true. The psalm is about God, the king of the earth. Not that God will be the king, not that God was the king, but that God currently is our king. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way. That's what I started with. When there's tragedy, right? When things feel like they're going out of control, where your home is, where your relationship is, your marriage. When we walk through seasons of drought, and depression, when it feels like we're in the pits, or when our sin is just making the muck of things around us, is God really on the throne? Because I look around and is he really there? And what the psalmist knows and where the psalmist has taken us from 42 and 43 to this point is what? There is a reality of brokenness in which it's okay to feel frustrated. That's Psalm 42, 43, and 44. We feel it. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean we're exempt from sorrow or from pain, right? That, that, that's not what it means. But 45, 46, 47, the center, the second reality, the bigger truth holding us and all things together is that there is a king over it. And this king is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I want to give three examples and then we're going to kind of wrap up. 
is God there? Especially when things seem crazy. First one is a personal example. It's definitely a little bit lighter. Um, but a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2019, I went on a trip uh, with a couple of my friends and closest friends. Sorry, I'm looking for, <gasps> I got it. Some of my closest friends and um, we went on a trip and you know, I just wanted to, these are like dear brothers to me and they love me and support me and just challenge me, I think in ways that help me to see more of God. And I just wanted to do something like, you know, that would bless them. So while we're in California, I was like, I want to take you guys to a hockey game. You know, none of them have ever been to like, to, to watch hockey before professional hockey. And if you've never been there, it's fast and it's crazy. And you know, I'm like, oh man, we would love it. So before the trip, I'm like looking all these things up, trying to plan the dates. You know, I, I, I do everything. I'm like, I, I spend a lot of time and, and you know, I tried my best and I spent, you know, talking to Eden, like spent, and you couldn't spend too much money, but I, I spent the money that we could to buy these tickets. And I'm like, all right, okay, we got it. I, I can't wait to surprise these guys. And then, we are on the trip, the day comes, we get to the stadium, and I'm like, I can't find the tickets. I'm, I'm looking everywhere, yeah? And I start to panic. And I'm in the car, we're in the parking lot, just ready to walk to this thing, and then I swear that it was in my little book, you know, that I, that I had put these things in. And I realized after calling my wife, and she's back at home, she's like, no, they're right here on your desk. <laughs> like you left. And I'm like trying to call the, 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 the ticket people and like, hey, you know, is there a way I can do this digital instead? Does it have to be hard copy? And they're like, no, because like the whole, you know, forgery thing, it, like if it's hard copy, it has to be hard copy. You, 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 like, I'm so sorry. The only other option you have is you got to buy new tickets. I'm like, I spent all the money I had. Like, what are you talking about, you know? And I'm so frustrated at myself. I'm talking to these guys. I'm like, you know what? Let's just go to the stadium. I don't even know why we did that. I'm like, it's just increasing the pain the closer we're walking there. Let's just go there. We can try and talk to the ticket booth and maybe something will happen or we can see what we can do. And they're like, ah, you know what? Like, yeah, if anything, we can just buy the tickets. It's so sweet of you to like think about that and try and, you know, you were trying your best, Duke. You know, you were trying, it was, it was enough and whatever. And so I'm super frustrated with myself. But honestly, you know, if I'm being honest, I was, I was a little bit frustrated with God. And he had nothing to do with it. That's the crazy part. But I, I, I wanted to bless them so badly, right? And I'm like, God, you know why? You know I wanted to bless them so badly. Like, like how do you let me do this? Like, I know I need your help. I'm asking you for help. Like, why? Why? So here's how the story goes. We get to the stadium, okay? I'm talking to the ticket booth. I tell them the whole story. I'm from Hawaii. There's no way to get the tickets. Can't you just go back and go? I'm like, yeah, there's, that's, that's not going to happen, you know? So I'm telling them the story. And uh, they say, I'm so sorry. You're going to have to buy new tickets or whatever. So we walk away from the ticket booth. And I'm like, you know, what should we do? We're trying to figure things out. And all of a sudden, I see this guy walk up to me. And he's wearing a suit. I'm like, what is this about? Like, I, I promise I was speaking respectfully. Like, I mean, we're already outside the stadium. The guy comes up to me and he's like, hey, I heard you talking to the, uh, the people in there. I was like, and? And he was like, and I want to help you guys out. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I'm actually the president of marketing, whatever. I'm like, what? You know? <laughs> And he's like, yeah, come on, come on with me. And so me and, and, and three of my friends, we start following him into the stadium. He actually takes us through security. We don't have any tickets or whatever, right? We come through the, the metal detector stuff, and he has this little pouch thing, and he prints out four tickets for us, right? And I'm like, how much is this going to cost, you know? I was like, you know, I don't want to tell him, like, bro, I'm like, I don't have any money to buy more tickets. But he's like, he prints these tickets out, right? And uh, I get these tickets, and he's like, no, they're on the kings. They're on the house. And I was like, what? I didn't even care where they were. But I look down at the tickets, and they're right off the ice. Yeah. And we walk through, and my heart, everything in it was like, 180 degrees, you can't imagine. We were gonna sit in the nosebleeds. We were sitting in the Himalayas, you know? Like that was my ticket. My boys were in the Himalayas. Now we're like on the ice. And I'm talking to God while we're walking through this place like, 
God, how could I ever have questioned your plan? And you know what he told me? You thought you were the only one that wanted to bless your friends. I was after it too. And there was so much in me, like, you look at, take one snapshot of that moment, and I'm questioning, is there a king? (laughs) Silly as it is. But if we're being real, personally in your life, like, we feel those things too. Those moments, those seasons, those days you walk through. And it's like, is there a king? There absolutely is. And what our children's stuff taught us, what scripture tells us in this king, he often works in ways and in times and reasons that we can't see in a moment. So if we're being honest, that's a silly example, but I know that there are people in here whose marriages are hanging on by a thread or are with a spouse or at this job and you're wondering, God, I've been praying, I'm trying, and it still looks like dot, dot, dot. And Psalms 47 reminds us what? We have a king, and he hears. And just because it's not going exactly how we imagine, it doesn't mean he's not in control, working all things together in his time for the good of his people. Second example, it's not a personal story anymore, it's scripture. You guys remember Joseph? Joseph, Genesis, he's not perfect, but you could have never you know, expected what would have happened in Joseph's life, right? He's bullied by his siblings, abused by his family, betrayed by the people that he loves. He's wrongly accused and then falsely imprisoned. He's forgotten while he's in jail, and then forgotten again. He's lonely, isolated, separated from his family. Decades go by. Not a short time. Decades go by. Lands in a job he never intended to. Serves a man he never thought he would. Lands in a position he never could have, so that ultimately God, through Joseph, would save the brothers who betray him and the entire people of God. That's kingship. And over those 22 brutal years of Joseph's life, I wonder, I wonder if Joseph ever looked up and felt how I feel sometimes, like, God, are you, are you in control? He absolutely is. And he understands that. And he gets there. And it's not just about what God does through Joseph. It's about what happens for Joseph. He's reconciled with his siblings. In fact, he's vindicated in front of them. He's justified all of this accusation, justified as righteous in the annuals of history. And he's second in command of all the world. And he says to his brothers who sin against him, who hurt him, who were trying to, they did it intentionally. You meant it for evil, but what? God tended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the salvation of many lives. 22 years ago, 21 years ago, 20, whatever, in Joseph's life, he never could have planned or predicted that that's what God was up to. Was God the king? He absolutely was. And the entire time he's been weaving, working, every moment together for God's glory and for our good. Third example, it's the best one. It's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. From our perspective of the disciples, sorry at that time, there's so much that doesn't make sense, including the bulk of his ministry. The Messiah comes, the savior for his people, and he's born in poverty, a scandalous way. People question him. People reject him. He's scorned. He's looked down upon. There's there's not much making sense. These people constantly through his life are after it, wanting to take him out, wanting to kill him. In fact, the most influential people, religious people who are supposed to receive him, what? They hate him. They hate him. And then the last part of his life gets the most craziest. He's telling them, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. They don't hear it. Why? 
Because their expectations of God the King and what he's supposed to do through his Messiah was totally different than what God needed to do. He was after their deepest needs. The outcomes, we can trust him with it. He, he knew what he was doing. But the last day of his life, what happens? He's despised, rejected by men. I'm reading Isaiah 53. A man of sorrow is acquainted with grief. He's despised and not esteemed. He carries our grief and sorrow. He's pierced, he's struck, he's afflicted, he's crushed. He's stripped naked, humiliated. People are gambling for his clothing. People are mocking him. And this is the king? If you're the king, why is it supposed to look this way? Why is it happening? Whoa, why is it happening in this way? Why would God allow this? Isaiah 53, 11 says that out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. It didn't make sense. But God, in the climactic apex of history, called his son the king, the king we read about in Psalm 47, worthy of praise and worship and exalted and, and ascended this king to condescend for us, family, for us. Philippians 2 says, and he doesn't count his equality with God. 47, everything we've just read, something to be grasped. But he empties himself by taking the form of a servant, born in the likeness of men, and he humbles himself to the point of death, death on the cross, where he sheds his blood to forgive our sin. He tears the veil apart, removes every and any obstacle from what would otherwise prevent us from having relationship with this king. In any one of those instances, it wouldn't have made sense. In fact, we know that because what do the disciples do? They're like, this ain't on program. I'm out of here. And then God begins to unveil the hand a little bit, uh, 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 show where the redemption is going. And we see Christ not there to save and preserve his life, but to give his life as a ransom for us the many, all people, Psalm 47, so that they would come to this king now. And here's, I, I love this part. In verse eight, it's talking about the holy throne of the king, right? The glorious throne of the king that he ascends to. That, that, that's verse eight. Well, now because of Christ and what Christ has done in demonstrating his, his absolute kingship, not in staying there, but condescending in great love for us, Hebrews four says, this throne of holiness and glory is now a throne of grace. Hebrews 4, 16. It's no longer a throne that keeps us from God, a holy throne that we can't approach. It says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And because of Christ, this big God, this Majestic king we talk about in Psalm 47 is our king. And he gives us full access to himself. God our king invites for us in all seasons to come and approach him. It's why we walk through Psalms 42, 43, and 44. The sorrows and the hurts and the confusion. You see why it stands here in the middle? Because what the sons of Korah are saying and you, my dear, in the middle of the hurt, have access to the king. So why does Psalm 47 matter? Why does it matter if we see God as our king? There's a million reasons, but I got three. So we would understand where we find, where you find, your ultimate help and hope and joy. So you would understand how precious the access that you have truly is also it matters because it tells us it reminds us something will always be the king in your life always the thing you worship and follow the thing that dictates what you do how you live what 
you know, gives the final say in your life, what gives you purpose in your life, the one you seek to please, the one that brings order and guards you and is a source of joy. And who you place on that throne dictates and determines everything about you. The last reason, why does it matter that we see God as the king? Because in the light of his throne of glory and grace, holy but grace, there's no thing, no one else worthy of our praise. Aloha, I am Jason and I'm the media director at the Kakaoko campus. And I wanna say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you were inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things that are happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you made that decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to click on the I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of our website and fill out a form so we can stay connected. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There you'll find five short videos about living the life of Christ and a free discipleship booklet to designed to encourage your new walk of faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.